When we say that God is faithful, we understand he is true to his word. God's word says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Go forth in the peace that comes from believing with all your heart, mind, and soul that you are forgiven. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 34, verses 1 to 8. We read it responsibly as printed. I will bless the Lord at all times. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. Those who look to him are radiant. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. 
The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Just take a look at verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. You know, and when I, when I think of this, I think of, I want God to bless me. And I would say that the same is true for you. You want God to bless you. And, and what for me, that blessing means that, you know, that lift me up in the strength, in that faith, you know, strengthen me in my faith, you know, give me that contentment, that peace that only you can give. And, you know, here we're saying, I will bless the Lord. So when you bless God, what are you putting into your brain? You know, or do we just pass by the words? You bless God by walking with him, by proclaiming him as Lord and Savior, because only he can be your Lord and Savior. So we, we walk in that truth today and always. And we confess that truth with the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed. I believe God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified and died in his glory. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray together the prayer of the day on the far right of our worship home. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your wondrous plan of salvation through Christ. Give us the boldness and courage to share your grace and truth with other trials. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture readings are printed on the back of your worship folder. Uh, I'll be reading the Episcopal reading and the sermon text at that time. The Old Testament reading comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 to 8. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make you life the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of the food forty days and forty nights to pour the mountain of God. This is uh, an interesting story. It's one that, you know, if you read it, you know, it's, it's right after Elijah had challenged the prophets of Baal to this big challenge. He said, you, you build your altar to Baal, and I'm going to restore the altar to God, and then we're both going to pray, and the God that answers by fire, he is the true God. 
And uh, as you know the story, the prophets of Baal prayed all day. Well, know this. It's not the length of prayer that makes a prayer great. It's praying to the one true God that makes a prayer a prayer. They prayed all day long, and nothing happened. As evening came in, Elijah prayed. If you read the scripture, prayer lasts about 20 seconds if you read it out loud. Depending upon how fast you read. And God answered by fire. And then Elijah said to the people, Okay, you just saw what happened. Choose this day who you're going to worship. And the, and the people chose to worship the true God at that point in time. And long story short, the prophets of Baal were killed. And so you can see Jezebel is angry because she is the one who brought in all these prophets of Baal. And but you know, just because God God is with Elijah doesn't mean his life is easy. You see, it's a challenge. But also see, God is there for you. You and I have our challenges, but know that God is there for you. We rise to hear the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is written for us in John chapter 6, verses 35 to 51. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one, come, no, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets that they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. You know, and you know, we kind of pick up with this whole thought with the Lord's Supper. We're not having the Lord's Supper today, but you know, we can see the connection that Jesus is saying. You know, so we believe in the doctrine of real presence, that when you eat the bread, you receive the body of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. What a wonderful gift that God has given to his church. You may be seated now. We continue with our next 10 to 499. In the end of
Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is our text. In some senses of the word, all three of the reasons that the epistles were written are in here. People are getting off track, and, and that truth applies to today just as much as it did back there. And so Paul writes in the epistles to get people back on track, to, to look at themselves and say, I need Jesus in, in some senses of the word. And in this particular case, he's, I'm going to kind of clarify something. I know that over the past couple of decades that I've been preaching from this pulpit, I have said, you are Gentiles and I am Gentiles. And literally the word Gentile means, you know, non-Jew. Uh, biblically speaking, they had a unique way of speaking. You're either one of two different groups. Uh, to read Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. You know, so that either you're male or you're female, either you're Jew or you're Gentile, or you're Greek or you're barbarian. But in this particular case, he's using the word Gentile as a little bit of a, you were Gentile, you came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but in so doing, you've given up your Gentile ways. And he's saying, you guys are going back to your Gentile ways. You're going, you're, you're going away from Jesus. And so he's writing to them to get them back on track. And that, that is you and I. You know, today as you sit here, you, you might be on pretty solid ground. In three weeks from now, this message might mean a whole lot more to you if you could remember it. And to be honest with you, I know I would have to remember it too. Um, you know, because we, we, we come every week. And so these, these people in Ephesus, they, are, they were Gentile, they've come to Christ, and now they're being tempted to go back to their Gentile ways. And so Paul is writing to them to, to stop this going after the Gentile way, you know, to return, um, to return to Christ. Um, he uses the word to be renewed. So conversion takes place when God takes you and give, makes you a Christian, so to speak. But once that has happened, you've been given a freedom. So I'm just going to read to you a, another verse from Galatians that kind of talks about this freedom that you have when you become Christian. Galatians 5.13 You were called to freedom, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. So God has given you a freedom. A freedom to serve Jesus, a freedom to walk with Jesus. But in that freedom, you can also be lured away from Jesus. You can walk away from Jesus. And so he's saying, don't use your freedom that way. But it's so, it, it's so, it happens so easily. Even if you have, you don't remember, and I'm, I fit into this category. Even if you don't remember a time when you didn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we are sinful by nature. We know how to go back to sin very, very easily. You know, the world, I, I read this, you know, how do you develop a bad habit, good habit, and stuff like that. They say, to develop a good habit, you have to force yourself to do the same thing for 30 straight days. I, I don't necessarily take this as truth because, and this is why. During Lent, I will give up McFlurries for 30 days. Now, that might not seem, that might not be your weakness. But giving up McFlurries for 30 days is a pretty big thing for me. I've developed a habit, no McFlurries. 
But when Easter comes, I can go back to that bad habit just like that. Why? Because I have an inherited sin, an original sin, right in me. And the people in, back in Ephesus, and I'm not saying eating under the furries of sin. I don't want to get McDonald's mad at me or anything like that. I'm not saying that. What I'm trying to get across is that we can go back to our old ways pretty easily. Just as the people of Ephesus were going back to their old ways. Now what were their old ways? The city of Ephesus had, if you read the book of Acts, you know, they had a temple to Artemis. Artemis or Diana is the goddess of the hunt in Greek culture, but in the city of Ephesus, she became part of the fertility cult, meaning that, you know, you know, sexuality is part of their their worship of Artemis. And Paul was so effective in his preaching in the city of Ephesus that when he preached, people converted to the Christian faith so numerously that the silversmiths in town who made a living by making statues of Artemis were losing so much business that they band together and they kind of took Paul into jail, brought him before the court system. And so there was a lot of people who abandoned Artemis and all that went with this fertility cult and decided to follow Jesus. You know, and following Jesus, you know, there's a difference here. And it's not always easy. You know, so in following Christ, we, we, we are faithful to our husbands and wives. In Artemis' line, that, that was, you know, that, that's not the way it goes. You know, we don't lie, we don't steal, and, and, and that was part of Artemis' life. You can see that as he kind of goes through this list of things that, you know, and so they're getting back into this old way, and so Paul is writing them, and, you know, like I said, I think it's always a temptation for us to fall back into the way of sin, to be lured by Satan, to be enticed away from following the one true God. And so we, we walk with Jesus, and he uses the word walk here. We can walk with Jesus or we can walk away from Jesus. And so he's calling them to be renewed in the one true faith each and every day and to to understand what it means to walk away from Jesus. If you walk away from Jesus, you are lost. And so he puts on, as they come together here, he has five things that he wants you to look at. And you can kind of look at your text at verse 25 here. Therefore, having put away falsehood, speak the truth in love. When you catch yourselves in things where you're starting to speak half-truths to cover up something, you better look at yourself very, very closely. A half-truth is not the truth. So, in, you know, like I said, you might be doing great right now, but in a few weeks, if you start catching yourself, or a few months, or a few years from now, you start catching yourself and you say, well, I'm telling a half-truth. Uh, and you better, you better start looking at your life. Because if you can't tell the truth, you, deep down in your soul, know something's wrong. And know that God is there for you to give you power with the Holy Spirit, but also to give you forgiveness. Going on with number two in this list. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Personally, I kind of like the way the NIV writes this. Uh, in your anger, do not sin. You're going to be angry. Well, uh, I know I am. I, I can get there. But God is saying, I know you're going to get angry. You know, I kind of I hit this point a little bit last week. You know, 
Jesus had all the reason in the world to be so blue and angry when he was crucified, and yet he didn't strike out in anger. You know, why does the exact same thing can happen to this person as to this person, and this person will end up cursing, swearing, being physically mean and everything else, and this person does not? You know, if you're this person, it's time to say, okay, just done a lot, I've just done a lot of things in my anger I shouldn't do. I need to get Christ back in my life in a very, very powerful way. And again, know that Jesus is there to forgive you. And, and, and you're, like I said, you're going to get angry. Let's kind of remember, Jesus got angry. But in his anger, he didn't sin. Um, there's a story in Mark chapter 3, verse 3, where he's about to heal this person on the Sabbath day, but all the Jewish leaders are ganging up against him. They say, you can't do work on the Sabbath day. And it says, Jesus gets angry with these guys because he's about to do something good. But he didn't sin against them. He didn't start an argument and calling them names. He didn't. But he got angry. You know, this is one of those Bible verses that, you know, husbands and wives are, you know, are told, don't let the sun go down on your anger. That's pretty difficult. Again, more than anything else, it should open our eyes to say, yes, I need Jesus. I need Jesus to empower me, to lead me, to guide me, to forgive me. The Holy Spirit. Number four in this list as we go down there. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Um, put the best construction on everything. If you don't know the truth, don't spread an ugly rumor. You know, along those lines. Um, James chapter 1, let's be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. I also love this one about James. James says the tongue is the most difficult thing to control in the human being. That little thing I have is the most difficult thing to control of the human body. When that starts happening, you know you need the Holy Spirit for power, and you need Jesus for forgiveness. So be renewed. And number five, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Uh, so you know, some, there's some words here. I think you kind of got a good, good grasp of all of them. So what is wrath? Uh, doing or not doing something we should do to maybe protect somebody. Um, and it can go both ways. Not warning somebody. Um, you know, of, of coming danger, uh, anger. Strong feelings of dislike. You know, we kind of talked about anger and how it can be displayed. Um, clamor. You know, that's a word that we don't use very often. Uh, I'm not a walking dictionary, so I had to look this one up to get a little better grasp of it. But it's loud and unpleasant, chaotic noise. But it's us just spouting off because we're angry and not in control. And then slander, purposefully hurting somebody. He's giving to the church of Ephesus, he's giving to us a thing to look at and examine ourselves and saying, okay, no. You need the Holy Spirit to empower you. You need Jesus to forgive you. So get back, be renewed, be regenerated the one true faith. 
So he is correcting false doctrine. He is correcting false behavior. And he's giving them a warning. And a warning that is a warning of love. Know that. A warning of love. I had a good friend, and this, this is probably a story that happens so many times it's unreal, but you know, I grew up up north when you know there were there could be ice storms, but I still say <coughs> the worst ice I ever saw was in Burlington, Colorado. So I know ice exists here. Uh, you just don't have the hills in Burlington to make this story possible. But up there in Michigan, years ago, there was a hill that was very, very icy. When people came over the crest, there was about 20 cars in the ditch. So one of the young men that I casually knew ran to the top of the hill to go like this when cars were coming. And some of them slowed down, and he got them to stop and said, don't go over there. There's like 20 cars in the ditch. They heeded the warning. But he also said, there were some people that I'd be sitting here like this, and they just go, A warning is a loving thing when you're giving it love. So Paul is giving a warning to all of us that you need God, you need the Holy Spirit, and you go forward. And as he closes off here, this little section is, is closed off, because he's not closing. You know, he's got chapter 5 and 6 yet. There therefore be imitators of God, of God, as beloved children. If we're going to imitate God, let's look at what God did. He died on a cross to pay for your sin. He forgives you by grace through the faith. As you go about your lives, as you go about your lives, go forward with that good news. Have the peace that comes with it. And walk in God's love and walk with one another in that love. And be lifted up in the one true faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue by singing hymn 148, Come the Almighty King.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you lead us, you guide us, you call us to yourself to walk with you daily, but you also always give us that forgiveness of sin by grace through faith. Bless us, lift us up, today and always. We come before you, Heavenly Father, and pray that you would bless these named individuals, these families. We remember the Betty Kramer family as they grieve her passing. We also remember Ron Flurkey, Alina Palmer, Roy Burnett, Opal Scarpel, Glenda Wallstrom, Pat Downen, Damon Behe, Catherine Davis, Judy Conrad, Joellen Stout, Mary Coglazer, Agnes Audubon, Tina Suar, Rashara Diaz, Caleb France, Leonard Dunn, Irma Shaw, Vanessa Warden, Sid Gibbs, Arlen Tanner, Laura Washi, Charlie Wallstrom, Bev County, Rex Sollings, Chad Jensen, Bonnie Willis, Linda Morrow, Thatcher and Taya Flock, Ron Scott, Jarita Henry, Grant Dynas, Jim Abbey, Roger Gould, Sharon Palmer. We pray you bless our military men and women. Watch over their coming and going. Those who are certainly within arms danger, but we name Andrew Burton, Patricia Callahan, Josh Flurkey, Kyle Goodnour, Colin, Colin Medley, and Kobe Ross. Bless the moms and dads that raise their children up to know Jesus Christ. Watch over their coming and going. We also pray that you instill in your hearts and minds of our leaders a godly wisdom. But may that godly wisdom be in our heart and mind each and every day too, to lead us, to guide us, that we may be a blessing to those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may our risen and victorious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ watch over you, bless you, and keep you. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated and we continue by singing hymn 719, Go My Children with My Blessing.
Connor Laird's Rama and Roger. Thank you. I forgot. Uh, but I wish you the Lord's blessings. Uh, please join us for coffee, fellowship. Uh, have a great week, and I'll see you next week. Thank you.